Thank you, Rudula. But then uh, I don't believe that the doctors sitting here faint heart. They may have a very compassionate heart, but never, it's a very strong heart they have. This talk, uh, you know, um, uh, Dr. Vavikar wanted me to uh, do a large chunk of it. Where is it? It's not senior. Uh, you know, if I, I have brought it in three separate PowerPoints because if I make one PowerPoint, it will be too heavy sometimes, it just doesn't open. So, uh, I actually uh, thank uh, the organizers, I thank you all, I thank Dr. Shekhar for, uh, you know, putting so much of trust in me to carry on with this talk. And, It's just a non-routine cases. You know, very often uh, when these, uh, uh, you know, our medical fraternity, none of them, the guys uh, tell you, doctors, you don't get bored of doing cataract all the time. Uh, you know, I feel how much off the mark they are because for us every case is a challenge. And potentially every case can speak a surprise. And, uh, and thanks to the technology that so much of, like, just heard three of the lovely talks. There's so much of technology getting added all the time that uh, we are literally on the edge of a scene all the time because of that one has been so very interesting all along. And uh, what I'm going to show now, uh, nothing very fancy, nothing very uh, uh, you know bad in the acts, but uh, you know friends, uh, as we go into our practice for a little longer. You know, all kinds of characters are going to come to us. And for a patient when he comes to us, you are the doctor who can do everything. So I think once in a while, to see some unusual ones, it does help. With this, I go to my uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, okay. And now, um, you know, these are, these are very uh, commonly seen. Uh, uh, So, uh, very often when you have, uh, you know, these small pupils, uh, if, you are, if you are careful, the first thing that you obviously do is to try and separate the iris from the lens and then you have these cyclic membranes. If you, if you are in the right plane with the micro forceps, you can literally peel it off. And after that, these pupils normally open up. Now these are all the soft pupil, but you definitely want it to be a slightly opened up with pupil expanders. And one of the expander that works good in such cases is VHEX. VHEX is really good for such uh, you know soft ones. If you have a rigid pupil, probably uh, this is not the pupil expander you would go in for. And when you have small pupil to improve your visibility, uh, you would always use some stain. The surgery here normally is not a big issue. You can choose a uh, you know, technique of your choice. I normally prefer the, the burst mode. It's just that, uh, you know, nothing much to show in this. And for those of you who have not used PHEX, uh, the best part of PHEX ring is, 
it's easy to put in and easy to come out. You just have to, uh, you know, implant your lens, and with, with, you know, you use your uh, dialer to uh, get it off the iris pupillary uh, margin, and then just pull it out. So it's as simple as that. See, this is a very simple technique most of us might be using, but you know, it depends on from where you get this oblique light. So especially when you have a corneal opacity, your coaxial light is going to scatter and your visibility definitely degrades. At that time, a simple thing like getting a light from the side and putting your microscope light off literally makes your surgery easy because here you really don't want the glow you want to you know uh, work on your rexis or work on your nucleus management which you can very efficiently do if your light is properly directed and once your assistant has a hang of where to hold it you know it comes by trial and error and then it's it's like walking in the garden but it's really enjoyable. Like some of you, if you have done scuba diving or snorkeling, you know, that kind of a, you know, a look you get, you enjoy it. Just, just uh, like optics like here, uh, you know, fiber optics that you use for. Uh, uh, now, this is a small pupil. And definitely this is also a rigid pupil. When you have a rigid pupil or a small pupil, when you try and do stretch pupilloplasty, uh, do it very softly because when you, when you use a lot of force, there is a tendency for this pupil to tear at different places. Of course, staining of a capsule in a small pupil is mandatory. And this kind of a pupil asks for a little rigid expander and here I am using malleagin string. Malleagin string, to put it and to get it out, uh, you need to be a little trained after watching it a couple of times and then get it. Now look how you have to literally you know, pull it and push it to get it in place. And as you would expect, these long-standing cataracts will have capsule that is fibrous. And doing rexis on a fibrous capsule is always a tough issue. Very often, the rexis may not be complete. Sometimes you may have to use your scissors to extend it. Sometimes it may not be continuous, it doesn't really matter because they don't tear into the periphery. But here the nucleus management becomes a little bit of a challenge. If you have heard to what Sandeep has said and the previous speakers, you can use your FACO dynamics well enough. And this is the important step when you put naliogens. You have to use your second instrument to uh, you know, guide them properly into that cartridge. See, if you ask me, one of the causes of avoidable blindness caused iatrogenically in India that these RK patients are some of them. You have lots of them silently living with vision which is very much compromised and it is compromised because of multiple cuts 
with thoroughly aberrated cornea and when they come for cataract surgery it's also a problem for us one, you can't use the best of the lenses for them and they come with highly aberrated cornea where to get them to see or improve their visual acuity definitely becomes a problem so a thing that we normally use today is pinhole pitoloplasty for these patients earlier the concern used to be what if I close this pupil how will I do that fundus examination but that's not an issue today with the better fundus cameras that we have you can always do it through a very tiny opening the entire retina can be seen and for some reason if you want to uh, open it up it's only a sitting on a YAG laser and just YAG it and it just comes off and all the time you have to be looking at the Purkinje images sometimes when you close this pupil the Purkinje image get covered at that time you can always go with a cutter and create another small you know notch into that pupil so as to open that Purkinje image sometimes you have to use more than two or three sutures to get a small tiny pupil bang in the center and for this patient she had she required minus 10 cylinder and she was post of uh, how much was that 612 with minus 3 and that was a fantastic vision that she was uh, getting then I come to another situation which very often uh, we get and that's posterior plaque a plaque means there's a potential space between the posterior capsule and that plaque and if you try hard enough you can definitely get it out I go stepwise I use a dialer if the dialer doesn't help me, I use my Rexis forceps, which has sharp, sharp tips. Sometimes, even that forceps cannot do the job. At that time, I use cystodome. But this cystodome, the tip is only tinyly bent, not like the one that you use for your Rexis. See, this is a cystodome with the, with the tip which is bent very tinyly, so that you can just use that sharp tip to you know continuously try and raise it at some stage it gives way the moment you get an edge which you can hold with your forceps that is all that you need then your forceps this is the micro forceps the merex forceps which you can use either through the main opening or through the side port to complete it the reason you do it, especially when you are using premium lenses, is you use premium lenses to give them the warp effect and if you have such plaques unfortunately located in the center, they prevent you from getting it and that's the reason you would try and get it. This is one of my very old case since uh, Dr. Shekhar was very insistent on a larger talk. I had to dig out few from my old clippings. Now this patient came with a history of a trauma that had occurred several years back when there was a huge corneal tear that was sutured and he was left with a, you know, a big scar and entire iris was covered. So, and then, uh, then I went through that uh, small opening that I go and got at the side. The history was, and from the from the history I could make out that the entire you know the lens had ruptured and the whole thing had come out. 
So I took a chance and created this pupil. I used a single piece lens and tried to put it in, but on the trailing haptic, I put a safety suture. In case the lens starts sinking down, I have this suture to hold on and to bring it out. But to my luck, there was enough of a space for that lens to stay. This was one patient who I always remember, although I've done it many years back. I haven't seen a similar case after that. This was a case of, you know, uh, hypermature cataract capsule has ruptured and the nucleus has prolapsed into the AC. So I decided to operate him. First thing I had to do was to put uh, myotic and decrease the pupil size, put dispersive viscoelastic in front of the nucleus, behind the nucleus, use cutter to you know, clear the pupil of vitreous and constantly with bevel down technique with very high vacuum and aspiration fluid. I tried to have a good purchase on the nucleus and kept cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces but all the time keeping my bevel down because to operate in the AC is a little risky from endothelial point of view. And as luck should have it, the entire thing went off without any uh, issues. Then obviously the question was, how are you going to manage the visual rehab? And then I tried one of my very favorite techniques, and that was suturing the three-piece lens on to the posterior surface. If you remember, in the earlier days, we used to have holder and folder method, and this is called bucket handle technique, in which you fold the lens and put those haptics behind the iris and just release it. Because of the size of the pupil, the optic stays above and the haptic goes behind and automatically there is an optic capture and that optic capture gives you that slit kind of a pupil to your advantage because that is when you can suture that haptic onto the iris this was the time um, when we didn't have this fourth or single pass but we had Sipsa technique of suturing. So the Lester hook, you could bring those sutures out through the main opening. But today we would do it differently. We will make side ports and take it out. And once those sutures are tied, the optic is pushed back behind the iris. And uh, that's it. And these patients do extremely well, there is no pseudo-phacodonesis, the lens stays there pretty well and they do quite good. This was a patient who called up and said, doctor since yesterday, you know, since today morning, I have suddenly stopped seeing <coughs> and he had iris clip in his eye. And when you see through, uh, uh, you know, um, coax here, you can actually see that the iris clip lens, one enclavation has come out, obviously because you see an iris defect there, the second enclave is strong enough. So what I do here, this, this, I did last week, I haven't seen his results, and he never called up. Because he used to call up every day. Since he didn't call, I'm very happy that he must be doing very well. You know, I decided to use iris hooks. 
because in the process of getting that haptic outside, I didn't want to strain, put some strain on the one entry that's already there with visco, minimal viscoelastic in the AC. I tried to get this haptic in front of the iris. After that, the job of those hooks are over. I, in fact, I want a pupil to stay small so that the lens doesn't go back again. I go with the forceps and now slightly below that defect. Now ideally that position is not an ideal position because now the lens is fixed slightly below. So as to take care of that, first I try and cover that defect because that defect can be nasty. That will do by the same technique where single throw, I mean what's that? Single pass, four throw. And it's a beautiful technique, very simple to do. If you notice, I used one side port to go in and the, left, the needle came out not through any side port but it came out blindly. You don't need to uh, have another side port there. And then, uh, let me just. So, once I have covered that defect, now the lens position is below where it ideally should be, and that can be very nasty because your optic edge will always be exposed whenever you know the pupil dilates, and that can give a lot of problems. So you have to do a second pupilloplasty to cover that 12 o'clock defect. So I go with a needle which is slightly bent and try and cover it in the upper part. And with a lesser hook, you try and pull that loop and create four throws through that and just pull it and then use your micro scissors to the main opening to cut it. So what you have effectively is a pupil that is nicely small and round and if you want to dilate it, there is enough place in the lower portion for the pupil to dilate. And when you see it at the end of the surgery, the pupil looks pretty neat. And this, uh, this, this eye is bound to do well. Uh, I cannot say for sure because uh, it's only one week. So, I'm just changing my power point. It's not coffee then. If there is an uh, if there is a oh, parameter uh, to monitor the surface heart rate, like the active fluidics, I think we'll be seeing you know large fluctuations in the heart rate for the surgeon. And so I'm saying it's not for the faint heart rate. Any questions for so far? to say or advise you anything uh, when you were pulling the posterior capsule that is posterior plaque I think uh, if I left hand if you would have put a continuous irrigation that would have kept your posterior capsule little deeper and you would have more holding of a, a plaque and you possibly you are done very well but you would have saved the posterior capsule from getting teared up that's what I feel there would have been a pressure of irrigating fluid on the posterior capsule. That's what I feel. When you do such maneuvers, you want your capsule to stay very steady. So you fill it with viscoelastic and you kind of stretch the pupil. When you use irrigation, your capsule is all the time 
goes up and down. And that's when those fine movements cannot be done. Now here, with the sharp sister toe, when you try to just go, not touching the posterior capsule, but to be in the plane where the plaque is, you have to have everything steady. And that works better with, uh, you know, uh, a nice viscoelastic field. And second thing, uh, uh, elogy. Yeah. Yeah. That gives you better space. And then you go through a sideboard, which is not a regular sideboard, you try to take a sideboard as, you know, peripheral, because you want to stay in line. You see, you don't want the cornea to get slightly folded. The move, because you're working at high magnification, corneal flows can, uh, you know, deteriorate. So, uh, I go to the part two. Now, this is a case which has undergone multiple surgeries. And the last surgery was silicone oil removal. And a patient comes with poor vision. He is seen by two, three consultants. And all of us are of the opinion that he has got silicone oil deposits on, his, on the lens. And not on the anterior surface, on the posterior surface. But his capsule is intact. And there is no reason to explain this. And his pressures have gone up. He is on multiple medications. The eye is red. So the one easy option that I thought of was first let's, let's get the lens out and maybe combine it with MIGS. In my hospital we do HFDS which is high frequency deep sclerotomy which can be done on an um, earthly machine. We are doing it for the last 6-7 years, maybe more. It's a, it's a fairly good technique, but with limited results. In a sense, if you, if you want to get your pressures down by 5 to 7, you can definitely try this. Maybe out of 3 medications, 1 medication can come down. Sometimes the patient is coming for a cataract surgery with 1 medication. Uh, we combine cataract surgery with this so that you know, that medication can go away. So that's the background of that procedure. So, with the idea to uh, do an IOL exchange, I make an opening which is not 2.4, it is around 2.8 and try to flush out the anterior chamber hoping there will be some, you know, um, uh, emulsified silicone that I can remove. And as I progress, I realize that there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, this material, uh, emulsified thing, all around. And once I reach under the lens, because if you want to get the lens out, you have to separate it from all around. And that's when I realized that what I thought all along as uh, silicon and oil deposits on the lens uh, doesn't seem to be that, but just the emulsified silicon oil which is stored into the capsule of iron. And this has not happened immediately after the, uh, after the silicon oil removal. It has taken some time because the patient was seeing well for some time after it. So this is quite a confusing stuff as to how come this silicon, where did it come from and why the patient persistently has high pressures as well. But anyway, I thought I have completed the job and the next job, next step was to go on for HFDS. In HFDS, we constrict the pupil, fill it with HFD, fill it with uh, um, dispersive viscoelastic and with the help of direct uh, lens, you go with the HFDS probe HFDS means you create a direct channel between the chamber and the Schleps canal. You do it at six places and uh, you know two or three of these channels also if they remain patent and straight into the Schleps canal uh, it seems to work and gives you. So at the end of it, when I am just trying to get the visco out, I see a shining thing then I know that uh, you know something is amiss. See, now this cannot be there because this is uh, uh, something from the vitreous. And then I realize that I am seeing a bit of silicone oil as well. 
Now this is a case where silicon oil has been removed and probably a large uh, you know, bolus of it had just stayed back and that is what was gradually leaking out. So I go with the irrigation, with the dialer, lift up the lens and with the scissors, uh, with, the, with the 26 number needle, I make a, uh, I make a puncture into the posterior capsule and try going with the cutter but that was a wrong step because there is no vitreous there I might as well uh, go with the irrigation or just with the spatula since it wasn't happening so I went with the spatula after this and the whole silicone oil bolus you know came out like one big thing and uh, after that uh, the surgery kind of over and this patient did well uh, his vision improved uh, dramatically because uh, his uh, visual axis had cleared up and it also helped you know, keep his pressure with two medications and with a lot of comfort. This patient, very interesting case, presented with a greatly disturbed vision, operated four months before went to two to three ophthalmologists they said it's difficult someone said I'll do IL exchange but nothing more than that when patient comes to us if you notice this, it's, a, it's a case of glued iron where if you look into that picture all the three sides where congenital was touched you have sterile thinning. You can you can literally see the haptics, but here the haptic is exposed. And if you look at the pupil, uh, it's updrawn, and part of the iris is incarcerated into the wound. And if you look at the optic edge, the upper edge which should be facing up, it's facing forward. That means the lens is markedly uh, you know tilted. And because of that tilt, the vision is uh, you know, greatly depressed. So that means patient was not at all happy with this. Uh, the macula was okay. The uh, oculizer did show a big cylinder, but there was nothing much that I was able to do anything for that cylinder. And looking at this uh, uh, scleral situation, I was just wondering, See, to me, the most pressing thing was to get this lens out as early as possible because every time the patient would move his eye up, move her eye up and down, the haptic would come out and go in. You know, you could see it travel. It would come out, it would go in, only tip was left behind. So that means it was a time bomb. Any time, you know, the infection could go in. out of that other group is not difficult in any time and uh, 
I'm sure uh, uh, Ram would agree to that. You know, it is never stuck. Right. When DC also mentioned it, uh, you know, this water is the other temperatures exposed, so that now the way we fix it, it will just shrunk and water is there. Could you have just uh, cauterize that exposed tip so that it just uh, shrinks and goes inside and at least as a primary procedure you could have tried this and uh, you know whether the lens just uh, your main concern was that the uh, tip was exposed that could act as a conduit for infection. Yes. If you just cauterize that tip and allow it to shrink and uh, go inside the screener and maybe whether that would have been a simpler surgery no, and whether it would have been still, uh, tilted. There is no vision. Sometimes, uh, you know, you do come across uh, the real hard ones. This was a black cataract. I'm using a pupil expander. You know, if you're, if you're working on a, in, a hard, in a difficult situation, at least the area should be well opened up. And in such cases, you normally stain them because staining improves your visibility. such cases, when, when you have a big nucleus, you try to shave it so that you know its anteroposterior thickness is <coughs> reduced and you have some room to work in. And then depending on whether you want to do four cotton or um, you know phaco chalk or whatever, in this case I am using phaco chalk, I am using burst mode. But it's always difficult, especially when the capsular bag or the zonules are weak. And in this case, uh, it, they are weak. So soon I have to, you know, uh, try and do some other things. What I do is first thing I inject viscoelastic into the bag, get the endocapsular in, and once that is in, I go for the hooks and fix the bag. Hooks are a great tool when you're working on such difficult zonular, uh, you, know, you know, structures because they give you a lot of stability. But very often, when it comes to putting your endocapsular ring little before, and if by your ill luck, if the epinuclear sheet stays behind the endocapsular ring to get it out uh, sometimes is a challenge. And this is how you can use the process to just pull it out. So uh, you know this is this is a uh, very nice tool BS. So, 
So uh, in this, this is the last one. Uh, before the people have time, I can go to next, but mostly I'll stop here. Traumatic dialysis, you know, cytodialysis, cleft uh, A cytodialysis cleft is a separation of the ciliary body from the scleral spur, creating a direct connection between the anterior chamber and the supraoral space. We had this patient coming to us, 56, so presented with gradual progressive pain, you know, painless blurring of vision. History of trauma, seven years before. Concerned elsewhere, diagnosed with retinal issues. He was intermittently on prednisolone and homotopy. His visual acuity was 3 meters, application was 4, slit lamp showed traumatic nutriasis, and NST with dense diffuse, fundus showed retinal folds, scleral infolding, and disc edema. His gonioscopy uh, did show a large cleft. His UVM reports revealed the cyclodesic cleft, which is 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock position along the right side of certain rotation, rotation of ciliary body and processes. So, if you look at the standard uh, protocol, you know, uh, for less than 4 o'clock, you have medical management, which consists of cyclodesic agents and steroids and uh, you know, uh, laser protocolation. And if it's more than 4 o'clock, you have surgical management like direct cyclotexy, encephalage and cryotherapy or continuous ab This is a picture of how full thickness scleral incision overlaid the cleft and using teno to suture it. Or uh, this is where continuous ab repair of traumatic cyclodiabetes is done. We did what we are good at. We are good at you know, rings and segments and hooks. I thought if you could do it by that, I thought let's see. The surgery was uh, just a routine surgery. There was, uh, uh, you know, pupil was uh, slightly dilated. So first went about removing the cataract. Well, the first cataract was done with obvious choice was to use a three piece lens with whatever benefit that those haptics would give you to push that uh, thing and after that I washed, I injected the uh, to constrict the pupil and use modified Sionis ring with two, haptic, two eyelets one eyelet was positioned between 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock and the second one of position exactly opposite I use the hooks to open up the eyes so that when I put my head in it will straight away go into the sulcus and out double arm needle was used to thread it through one eyelet and first the two needles were taken out when you have to go for such, uh, you know, insertion, it is always better to slightly bend the needle so that it's easy to put it. Then I took out those hooks and put them on the opposite side. And the second eyelid was threaded with 9 suture on STC needle. First, the needle was taken out to the opposite side port. And this time I used 26 for a railroad technique where the needle comes from out to in and the suture is passed. Similarly, you repeat it with the second needle. And once you have both the needles out and the sutures out, now is a time for you to insert your ring inside. This ring, you know, that eyelet requires the incision to be slightly enlarged. From 2.4, it goes to around 2.8. Once the ring is in, it is placed into the sulcus. Behind the iris, the viscoelastic is washed. Pylocarpal is put 
and the pupil is brought down. And after the scholastic is washed out, the final step is to suture and tie those sutures on either side little tightly. <coughs> and then of course, here I just made a groove. I didn't make any scleral flap and the ends were left and the conjunctiva was glued, I, you know, was put back using glue. And the patient was explained that by evening or next day you will have discomfort, you will have pain and if you get all this, be happy. Post of day one, his vision jumps to 636. IOP is uncontrollably high, slit lamp shows corneal edema, so I do anterior chamber paracentesis, pressure drops to 28, he is put on the usual medications. Post of day 3, vision goes to 618, pressure comes to 24, post of day 12, vision stays at 612, IOP 18. Post of day 30, his vision still stays at 612, IOP, NCT 19, he is on one medication, Vita free. And then, because on a company job he has to go to Nigeria, he goes away, so I lose contact. And last week, his, he sent an email, sorry, when his post of 3 months, his visual activity Best corrected is 6, 6 and 6. His pressure is 18. He is still on beta field. Probably if I had seen him, I would have tried without beta field to see if the pressure stays. But, but it, was, it was a great uh, improvement after 6 years of uh, you know, very poor vision. And uh, low, I mean, this is macula would show you know, retinal folds and hypotonus. All that was there. I hope everything is cleared by now. So this over. And then the last one. And of course, um, see, uh, not very often we get to see such cases. But this is a case of uh, pre existing posterior polar, pre existing uh, PC defect in a posterior polar cataract. One thing you should remember here is that in these cases the vitreous face is intact, vitreous is not disturbed at all and these are not very really hard cataracts. So if you can make sure that while you are operating you don't disturb the vitreous, most of your cataract is part you can do without needing vitreous. And finally, when only small bit of epinucleus or cortex is left, and if you are required to go for cutter, it doesn't really matter because there is less chance of anything falling into the ventures. So, these are the cases where you obviously not use a single piece. So you are prepared for a three piece. So your axis size cannot be too small or too big because you would like to do optic capture. This is where your phaco dynamics comes to your rescue extremely well. Here I am doing what I call as in situ four quadrant. You create a very superficial trench, you create trench sideways and then basically you are doing phaco aspiration where all your parameters are low even before the phaco tip comes out the irrigation is gone in because you don't want your AC to collapse and even when you want to change hands for a biomanual you will always take an additional irrigation from this side before this irrigation comes out at some stage when you feel that yes the vitreous is getting disturbed you go with a cutter but as long as you are able to get most of this chunk out, 
your binary works better. This is when I go with the cutter. Cutter with very low vacuum and high cut rate. You just want to cut it there. You don't want to succumb to anything. And switch back to irrigation. I mean aspiration. Then whatever small thing is left. The trick here is keep your aspiration port all the time closed so that nothing else gets absorbed, aspirated, but just that material. And, uh, and with this, uh, you are practically done. You go for three piece and nicely capture it. And uh, that's it. So. I am not over yet, it's only coffee break, but I will let it go. Another, another presentation, because my favorite topic of supplement session, I am not touched, I will not touch now, because we are getting late. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we thank you, sir, for a mesmerizing uh, show, sir. This was just <laughs> not for the introduction. Thanks a lot. I, I request Dr. Vavikas to present the moment. Thank you, sir. We request Dr. Ramamurthy for the next presentation.